Hello and welcome to Mr. Alvarez's Virtual Chemistry Laboratory. Today we'll be covering the acid-base titration lab. Introduction. In the chemistry lab, it is sometimes necessary to experimentally determine the concentration of an acid solution or a base solution. A procedure for making this kind of determination is called an acid-base titration. In this procedure, a solution of known concentration and volume, called the standard solution, is used to neutralize a precisely measured volume of the solution of unknown concentration, to which one or two drops of appropriate acid-base indicator have been added. Today we'll use phenolphthalein. If the solution of unknown concentration is acidic, a standard base solution is added to the acid solution until it is neutralized. If the solution of unknown concentration is basic, the opposite occurs. When carrying out an acid-base titration, you must be able to recognize when to stop adding the standard solution, when neutralization is reached. This is the purpose of the acid-base indicator mentioned above. A sudden change in the color of the indicator signals that the neutralization has occurred. At this point, the number of hydronium ions, H3O plus ions, from the acid is equal to the number of hydroxide ions, OH minus ions, from the base. The point at which this occurs is called the end point of titration. When the end point is reached, the volume of the standard solution is used carefully determined. So the materials we need, goggles of course, funnel. Uh, today we're going to use an unknown concentration of HCl, hydrochloric acid, and we'll have a known concentration, 0.25 molar. NaOH. We have our burette, that is this long glass tube with graduations. It starts here at zero and it ends down here at 50. We can see the valve, also known as the stopcock, is off when it is in the perpendicular direction. Perpendicular, it is closed and parallel is open. We have the burette stand and clamp. We have an Erlenmeyer flask. We have phenolphthalein, our acid base indicator. We have a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder for our acid, and we will also use a calculator. Let's set up. We'll take the funnel, put it on top of the burette, and fill the burette with base. We'll fill it up all the way past the zero mark. But be careful not to overflow it. But then we'll slowly open the stopcock to bring the base level down to zero milliliters, our starting point. Just like a graduated cylinder, you want the bottom of the meniscus on the zero milliliter mark. We can remove the base, set it aside, and now we'll worry about the acid. We are going to take 10 milliliters of acid. We take the graduated cylinder and raise the beaker and graduated cylinder to eye level so we get exactly 10 milliliters of acid. Once again, we want the bottom of the meniscus to touch the, I went too far, the bottom of the meniscus to touch the 10 milliliter mark. Just a little more. Perfect. 10 milliliters, we put it in our flask. Set the graduate cylinder aside for later. And also add two drops, or three drops in this case, of phenolphthalein. We're also gonna use a piece of computer paper so we can determine when the phenolphthalein turns a light pink. It'll be easier to see off of this white background. I'm gonna move the camera closer so we can see the procedure. 
So now that we carefully added 10 milliliters of hydrochloric acid and phenolphthalein into the flask, and we have our burette filled 50 milliliters of 0.25 molar NaOH, now we can perform our titration. So we're gonna start off slowly by turning the stopcock to the parallel position and let the base titrate into the flask. Now you might be able to see that once the base goes into the acid and phenolphthalein, you get pink in the solution. But when you swirl, the pink goes away. We know we reach our end point when the pink stays for 30 seconds of swirling. As you can see, as we put more base in there, the pink stays a little bit longer each time. The pink is a good sign. That means we set up everything properly. Oh, we're starting to get more pink, so we're gonna slow down and swirl. Phenolphthalein is colorless in acidic conditions, and it turns pink under basic conditions. So while it stays colorless in the flask, we know that we put the acid in the flask, and by dropping the liquid from the burette, it turns pink, we know that there's base in the burette. So it stayed a little bit pinker for a little bit longer. So we're getting closer to our endpoint. And it looks like we just reached our endpoint. One extra drop turned us very pink. So we'll take a note of the reading and then we'll be a little bit more careful next time. We'll slow down when we get closer to that number. After the first trial, we can see that we used 6.7 milliliters of base, 6.7 milliliters of NaOH in trial one. Let's try trial number two. But before we perform trial number two, we need to clean out our flask so now that we have our neutralized acid and base, we can pour that down the sink, rinse out our flask thoroughly, and we can work on trial two. As good scientists, we always perform our experiments more than once. Now that we're ready for trial two, we'll take 10 more milliliters of the hydrochloric acid of unknown concentration. Once again, make sure the bottom of the meniscus touches the 10 milliliter mark. As it does right here. We'll take 10 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. Pour it in the flask. And since we put three drops of phenolphthalein in trial one, we'll also use three drops of phenolphthalein in trial two. Now remember, at the end of trial one, we ended up with the burette at 6.7. We're not gonna start off at zero this time. We're gonna start off at 6.7 where we left off last time. So quickly, I'm just gonna drop about six milliliters in there, a little bit less. I'll go down to the 12 mark to make it go a little bit quicker. So I'll drop until the burette reads 12. And you'll see it's pink, but when I swirl, the flask goes back to clear or colorless. Now when I perform this, 
I'm actually going to turn this a little bit the other way around. So I can have my left hand, I'm right hand dominant, I can have my left hand on the stopcock and I can swirl with my right hand. Now I'm going to be very careful when I swirl. So I'll put a drop or two drops in that case and swirl. All right, went away, I could do it again. Another drop and swirl, it went away. So we go again. Another drop, swirl, went away. Pink for a little bit, but when you swirl it goes away. Another drop. And you'll keep doing this one drop at a time now that we're close. And we want that faint pink color. Staying pinker longer. All it takes is one drop too many and then you have that dark pink like we had before. And then you have to try again. You have to do another trial. So we'll try to avoid that. All right, so there we are. We swirled, very faint pink. What away, it wasn't 30 seconds, so it looks like we're one drop away. There's one drop at the end of the bureau. Let's see if we get it. I think we're one drop away. Let's see what happens. Okay. And there, now it's very dark. But that's perfect because we had one drop was faint pink, but it went away before 30 seconds of swirling. We did one extra drop, and now we have this dark pink, so that's exactly where we need to be. So when I read the burette, we're at exactly 13 milliliters, and we can take a closer look. So we can see the level of pink that the solution is, and then if we look at the burette, we used exactly 13 milliliters. Let's do some calculations. Let's fill out our data table. Before we can fill out our data table, we need to make a few corrections. Remember, our acid was our unknown. We did not know the concentration of our acid. However, we did know that the molarity of our base was 0.25 mole. Same thing down here, our acid was our unknown, and our base was 0.25 molar. Also, each time we used 10 milliliters of hydrochloric acid, we measured 10 milliliters using the graduated cylinder, and we poured it in the flask. What did change was the amount of sodium hydroxide. We started off trial one at 0.0, .0 milliliters on the burette, and then we titrated down to 6.7 milliliters. That means we went from 0, 0.0 to 6.7, we subtract these two numbers, that means we used 6.7 milliliters of base in trial one. Trial two, we didn't start at zero. We started off at the end point of trial one. So we started at 6.7 milliliters. And if you remember, we went down to 13, exactly 13.0 milliliters. So this time, we didn't use 13, we have to subtract these two numbers. So 13 minus 6.7 is going to be 6.3 milliliters. Now we're ready for our calculations. Our formula, Ma, molarity of our acid, which we're trying to find, times the volume of our acid equals the molarity of our base times the volume of our base, which we know. For trial one, molarity of acid is our unknown. Our volume of our acid, that stayed constant for both trials. That was 10, point, 10 decimal. It was measured exactly 10 milliliters, so 10 decimal milliliters. For trial one, and trial two, our molarity of our base was 0 0.25 molar. And for trial one, we put a one here, our molarity of our base, uh, excuse me, our volume of our base was 6.7 milliliters. So we'll plug in our numbers. MA, we don't know. 
times VA, 10 decimal milliliters, equals MB, 0 0.25 molar, times BB for trial one, 6.7 milliliters. We start off by multiplying the MB and the VB. So we multiply 0.25 times 6.7, and we get 1.675, we keep our units, M times ML, molar times milliliters, and that is gonna equal the left side, MA times 10 decimal milliliters. Remember, we wanna get MA by itself. So we have to get rid of the thing that's in the way. So we divide both sides by 10 decimal milliliters, divided by 10 decimal milliliters. And remember back to when we talked about scientific notation and other times of the year, if you're dividing by 10, this cancels out, this cancels out. We're left with MA, we can move the decimal place over one to the left. So MA is equal to 0 0.1. Of course, we round to significant figures. 10 decimal has two significant figures. 0.25 has two significant figures, and so does 6.7. So we go 1, 2. The 7 is higher than a 5, so we round to 0 0.17 molar. We do the same thing for trial 2. I'm not going to rewrite all the knowns and unknowns, except the only thing that changes for trial 2, our VB is now 6. 0.3 milliliters. We'll just separate this and we'll try again. We'll plug in our numbers. MA times 10 decimal milliliters equals 0 0.25 molar times 6.3 milliliters. Same procedure, multiply the right side, 0.25 times 6.3. That gives us this time 1.575 M times ML equals MA times 10 decimal milliliters. Once again, we want to get MA by itself, so we divide both sides by 10 decimal milliliters, divided by 10 decimal milliliters. Milliliters and milliliters cancel out. We can just move the decimal place one over to the left. So we get 0 0.1575 molar. Two significant figures again. One, two. Once again, seven. It's higher than five, so our answer is 0 0.16 molar. For trial two, Excuse me, for question two, it asks us to calculate the average molarity of your unknown NaOH solution from trials one and two. So we do the average. We take the two molarities, we add them together. So 0 0.17 M plus 0 0.16 M. We add those two together. We get 0 0.33 M. And since it's two trials, we'll divide that by two. And we'll get, right over here, 0 0.165 molar. Thank you for joining Mr. Alvarez's Virtual Chemistry Laboratory. Today we performed an acid-base titration. We took an acid of unknown concentration and titrated it using a base of known concentration. We also used phenolphthalein acid-base indicator, and we know we've reached our end point, our finish line, when our solution went from colorless to pink. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you learned something today. Please join us again soon.